Oh, okay, this is, yeah, can I sit back? Dude, that event was so gay. A couple of weeks back, I was hosting an event for Iranti, who is a queer organization working for the advancement of trans, queer, uh, and intersex rights in South Africa and on the African continent. And I'm at the event, and Tiff from Hala Africa is there, right? And she posts the event, says that she wants to collab with us on another event which is a sort of social media, queer-focused event blitz situation. And of course, I say yes. Tiffany's been doing incredible things in the online space uh, for queer representation on social media uh, through Holla Africa, which is so focused on like sex for queer people and sexual health. And it, it's been like this incredible platform. And Tiff and I had uh, talked before and we said that we'd always wanted to work together and we were like yeah 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 we're gonna do it and it's been like what a year now and when this opportunity I guess presented itself yeah we we went for it. So the event was a collaboration between Hala Africa and Iranti and I consult for Iranti but I was also at the event attending as me the film person you know and so it was this odd situation of wearing two hats at the same time. But I think it went like really, really well. I think we put this event together in the space of like a week and it was hella stressful, but it was incredible. Hi. Hello. Welcome to Irati House. It's nice to see faces here. We always love having events and doing the things so Thank you for showing up, for being here. I know it's cock today. Um, so there's drinks and stuff. Please go and help us out at the bar. My name is Zoe Black. I am a filmmaker, content creator, and I'm the media specialist here at Iran. Uh, I'm not gonna hog this mic for too long. Uh, I'm just gonna run you through just some like basic things for those of you. This event was specifically for queer creators. So we had influences from across social media, people who've done content for TikTok, uh, for Instagram, YouTubers as well. We had incredible filmmakers there and we partnered with a number of, I guess, like community organizations. So Iranti was there. We had a number of community benefit organizations that were there. Hala Africa was also doing an amazing thing to connect everyone together in the space that was just alive in a way that was so, so different. I think queer people find themselves in an interesting, but also like difficult position today. So much of the narrative around queer people in various spaces in the world has been very sort of defamatory over the last while. And I think they've been very targeted, very deliberate steps to smear the queer name, uh, to uh, frame queer people as being debaucherous, demonic, uh, problematic, uh, going against family and religious values. And it's this weird space in our context in South Africa specifically, because we have such a progressive constitution that affords these universal equal rights to every person in this country, that queer rights are fundamentally protected. 
that trans rights are fundamentally protected. But there seems to be this sort of disjoint between the, the things that we enjoy, the rights specifically, um, and this very deep hatred for queer people socially. We've also seen this on the African continent and globally as well, where there's been an incredible push for anti-LGBT legislation, policies. They've tried to shift the narrative um, around what it means to be queer, that somehow we're coming for everyone and everybody's going to be gay and trans. And it's just, it's difficult. It <laughs> puts queer people in such a weird position because the momentum of history has been pushing us forward in terms of these equal rights and realizing healthcare for everyone, realizing inclusive legislation for everyone. And now we're at a point where it feels like there's, there's been a lot of pushback. I had a 21 year old, super passionate. And she was talking to me about like, I have no idea how South Africa got these rights, like our, us as the LGBT community. And she was like, I'm so scared. One of these days they're gonna be stripped away from us because it feels like it was a fluke. So I'm like, if it's a fluke, it's not a fluke, Sisi. But you know what, we need to educate just like the ABCs of how we actually got these rights and how they will continue to live on and spread across the continent. Social media is English, right? It is done in a colonial language that is inaccessible for multiple communities, right? But also at the same time, I think around how traditional social media kind of puts forward a particular aesthetic of queerness and a particular queer. Social media is honestly the Wild West. I think that the age of information, the rise of Google, uh, artificial intelligence to a particular degree has thrown the expert out the window. And so we're in a position now where any person with a camera, any person with a microphone has, to a certain degree, uh, equal footing in generating content and putting information out there, whether that's accurate or not, uh, is immaterial. Everyone has that, that platform and they can grow that platform. And some people have grown platforms to incredible reaches. And so suddenly they become the experts. I don't think there's something fundamentally wrong with that. I don't think people shouldn't have platforms. And I love the fact that the internet has democratized us to a particular degree. But I think the thing that we're lacking is not so much on the production end, but it's on us as an audience, as consumers. It's sometimes incredibly difficult to differentiate between one person and another, the information that X is giving me and Y is giving me. How do we make those distinctions? How do I know who's giving me accurate information and who isn't? I think the skill to be able to discern between those things is partly something that we talk about at school. You know, we teach uh, this in academics, you know, citing your sources and make sure your, your information is correct before you publish something. But it feels like that slipped a little bit. And so as a consequence, both on people who are generating content that there isn't a whole lot of research and stuff being done before they post something. And it's so instant that it's so easy to do. Um, and then conversely, for an audience member who's watching it, uh, that skill isn't as developed as it used to be. I mean, I'm queer and I'm queer in a very specific type of way, right? I'm, I'm trans, I'm also pansexual, I'm also polyamorous, I'm also a person of color. And so the intersections of my experience is vastly different from every other person, right? Um, when I came out, that was a really, really difficult time for me. Um, I couldn't find any content and narratives that were similar to my own. And that was incredibly isolating. And I think that's so much of the motivation behind why I do what I do why I'm invested in telling queer stories, why I'm invested in authentic storytelling for queer people, for trans people specifically. Because when I was coming out, that was inaccessible to me. 
So by making that information a little bit more accessible, making my experience more accessible, I think people can then sort of see themselves reflected in the world around them. And that's, that's an invaluable thing. And moving into a very visible space uh, on YouTube initially came with a lot of heat. Um, the comments that I was receiving were hateful and I got death threats and it, it, was, it was a bit of a wild time. Um, but I think part of the way that we navigate these spaces is that we learn to build our community, right? We have to learn to build safe spaces on, on social media. Um, I've deliberately tried to create a community on YouTube that um, not only protects myself, but also protects the audience who's watching my content. And I think that's something that we often don't think about. Uh, we always think about engagement and we always think about how is this going to land? How many views are we going to get? Um, but the sense of community, we're lacking a little bit in that sort of community-centered approach to our online spaces. I meet so many young queer people and trans people specifically. And I sometimes wonder like what the future looks like, you know? I think the, the space where I'm at in my life, in my career, in this social media game, I've deliberately tried to craft those spaces, right? Because there wasn't those spaces for myself. And I wonder what the world is going to be like for younger queer people when they hit their 30s when they hit their 40s? What does it look like when they start having kids? What does it look like when they've got grandkids, if that's a thing, you know? Because that's a very real reality that so many trans people, so many queer people, we have their lives stolen from us because of the profound hatred um, that society has, I guess, projected onto us. And so events like these become so important. That spaces that allow you to be yourself, to live in a way that is authentic and true to yourself, but is also safe for you. To create work in an environment that is inclusive, an environment that is safe, and an environment that celebrates your difference, that celebrates your queerness, rather than diminishing it. For someone like me who is trans and a woman of color, the average lifespan for someone like me is 35 years old. That's wild to me. It was my 35th birthday this year. I turned 35 about two months ago. And I always made this joke that you know, I'm gonna be dead at 35, so I need to live my life the way that I need to. Because the thought that I am now beyond the statistical average is terrifying to me. So yes, it is a weird and difficult time for queer people. But this is one of those dark moments and the dark moments, they pass. There is light at the end, at the horizon. And if we just put one foot in front of the other, we'll get there. At least that's what I think. <sighs> Did you get that? Love